Hello, and welcome back to Literally Literary. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our previous episodes. This episode, we will continue our discussion on We Cast the Shadow by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. Last episode, we began the discussion on We Cast the Shadow, focusing on the characters, major themes, and connections we've made, as well as having been able to meet Maurice himself. This episode, we will focus on part one of his debut novel. You know, this is uh, quite the novel we got here and uh, hope, you know, you listeners um, get a chance to pick it up. Um, there's a lot in here that will resonate today, as we talked about in part one of our podcast. Um, and so that's why we're dividing it up, you know, because we realized that there's just so much to talk about in part one alone from part four parts. Um, so we're going to split it up that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, get right into the text, um, so much, uh, to talk about in terms of its, uh, themes and characters and, uh, symbolism. So, um, we had talked about last time already the epigraphs. So the, we can jump to, uh, chapter one, uh, you know, the, the very first opening. opening. Opening lines, baby. Yeah. And I know that we all, you know, talked about this one in the pre-show. So um, did one of you want to read it? Just uh, the first couple lines? Go ahead, Vanessa. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> the first couple lines? Mm-hmm. Okay. My name doesn't matter. All you need to know is that I'm a phantom, a figment, a man who was mistaken for waitstaff twice that night. Odd, given my outfit. Should I keep going? No, that's good. That's good right there. Okay. Um, So um, to the readers who've read um, Invisible Man, you know, this is um, an an homage here to the the prologue in that novel. And... um, You know, we talked about Invisible Man already uh, in the first episode, so we'll make some connections as we go further on. But, uh, you know, of course, very reminiscent of that. Um, Why do you guys think in this case for this protagonist that his name name doesn't matter? Well, I mean, I think I mentioned it in the previous episode how this is almost in direct contrast to the opening lines of Melville's movie Dick, which, um, you know, Ruffin uses as one of his epigraphs, right? a quote from Moby Dick. Uh, I think it just kind of to present a contrast, you know, when, you know, a lot of people focus and read on Moby Dick as, as this idea of the American novel uh, chasing this symbol of, of whiteness in the whale um, you have our unnamed narrator, which again parallels a lot of Invisible Man. You know, you have the contrast of my name is Ishmael, or call me Ishmael in Moby Dick to my name doesn't matter. Uh, kind of almost as a first introduction of our narrator and how he feels about himself, which ultimately is, is a thread throughout the book on, as you mentioned in the previous episode, this idea of like the sunken place where he places himself. Mm-hmm. Society, um, yeah, it reminds me of that that uh, invisible man, uh, the lower frequencies. Yeah, and just like you know, with the invisible man remaining nameless, um, you know that there's a lot of other characters in fiction where the protagonist, you know, goes unnamed, right? Whether it's um, you know Sunny's Blues or um, uh, Yellow Wallpaper or Blood Meridian. Um, so kind of in the same tradition of, you know, it doesn't so much matter the name as much as what they do. Um, yeah. And also um, speaking of like intertextuality, uh, something we didn't talk about last time is uh, Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground, mm-hmm. which I think um, Ralph Ellison plays around with a little bit in Invisible Man mm-hmm. is, is the sense that uh, in that story you have the character who his introduction is he i'm a sick man and i think it kind of echoes the second line here right all you need to know is that i am a phantom a figment Mm 
Right. And he kind of, again, speaking of how he feels about himself in society. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm. I hadn't thought about that. Vanessa, what did you think? I kind of felt like it was more of a placeholder as, and he represents a group of people and that these, these are kind of like the same experiences that they're having during this time. Mm-hmm. And you said in particular the, um, the, the bottom paragraph you wanted to highlight? Um, well, I think it's interesting, especially that he was mistaken. Mm-hmm. Like when I first read that paragraph, I was like, well, why is he being mistaken? And why is mm-hmm. it odd? Like, mm-hmm. it seems like he's at a very important dinner. You would think that he's wearing a suit. So it would make sense that he'd be mistaken. Mm-hmm. But then you go into the story deeper and he reveals that he's in like a Halloween costume that he was required to wear and he's dressed as a Roman centurion Mm -hmm. so then at that point it's like okay well why now are people mistaking him for being waitstaff when he's not dressed like a waiter would be right yeah Yeah, and even then people go out of their way to to go up to him in that sense like he says he's being a wallflower trying to stay out of the way and, and people are still you know, mm-hmm. I'm with that intention yeah and kind of the idea of costumes you know me uh to me um brings up like um you know the, the mask that these characters put on you know because of course um they're using them you know as we come to realize even just reading part one um, and yet, you know, he's this o- overeager, you know, um, um, dressed to impress, you know, anything for, for the machine individual, right? Yeah. Um, mm. And in part, maybe that's why he also says his name doesn't matter, you know, because it doesn't see himself as that important as someone who does have a name that kind of has an influence. Yeah. And uh, mm. quick, quickly, he finds out through one, another one of his colleagues, Riley, that uh, it's, this is a competition, like a hazing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it seems that uh, a position is going to be decided on, on this. And so moving ahead to page six, um, I found a pretty, a pretty relevant paragraph that, that kind of speaks to one of the larger themes of the book in, in terms of our character's desire to to fit in, be part of this machine, as you mentioned right now. Um, you know, he, he starts to question his, his costume and the reason why it might not work. And I think it's really important. Um, and, and is this also, it's interesting, this is a man who understands his history too, because um, he mentions Nat Turner. Um and well, let me go ahead and read read off some of those lines so we can mm-hmm. talk about them. So yeah, it's on page six. I suddenly realized I had made a serious miscalculation. Riley's costume was a great way to get attention and spread good cheer. Mine, on the other hand, was the sartorial equivalent of a glower. Centurions were badasses who killed anyone who crossed them. The only way I could have made the group any more nervous was if I showed up as Nat Turner, but I knew better, or I should have. There were many unknowns in my pursuit of happiness, but one thing I understood. Law firms like Seasons, Eustace, and Malvo didn't hire, let alone promote angry black men. If this was a competition, I needed a new strategy. The shareholders wanted entertainment. They wanted a good time. They also wanted subservience. They did not want to feel threatened. If I was going to win, I would have to demonstrate I was willing to give them exactly what they wanted. It's a pretty telling paragraph. Um, again, like mm-hmm. he he's aware of himself enough to know <laughs> that they fear him. He mentioned this idea of like dressing up as a centurion, the symbol of, of someone who's a, a badass, you know, fighting caricature. And then, you know, they want maybe someone more subservient. And like I said earlier, he mentions Nat Turner, right, who, mm-hmm. who led rebellions. Uh, you know, if he was going to fit in with the law firm, he'd have to change his costume, essentially, right? He'd have to fit in mm-hmm. or wear a different yeah. mask. Yeah. And, and um, 
you know, goes back to the, um, you know, I think we mentioned it in the, in the, in part one, um, the, the battle royale, right. From invisible man. That's also a hazing and, um, where just like, you know, the, 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 the teenager in that one, he feels like he's got to do whatever it takes, you know, to, to please them. Um, even if it means putting down others who are also black. Yeah. But the promise of, you know, being accepted or, or winning something. Mm-hmm. Mm. And um, it, I also found interesting, and, you know, we talked about this in part one in terms of his profession as, you know, this go-getter. But, you know, technically he's a lawyer, right? But it's kind of funny, you know, reading the novel that, there's not much like, you know, courtroom uh, things, uh, actions that he's doing, you know, the, all, all this, all these things are very like, you know, seem very working class, right? Someone is like rising up as like maybe a legal assistant or what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So it also goes to show like how, even though he's a lawyer, right, he's not getting that respect earned to him as, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Invisible Man Esquire or, you know, whatever his name might be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's even mentioned later on that um, he actually has a pretty good uh, pedigree in terms of his knowledge of law. He finished mm -hmm. first in his class. And uh, even though that's the case, some of the, some of even his classmates have been promoted above him before him. And, and there's this, this kind of power hierarchy. Mm -hmm. that, right. That we see built, built up. Almost like a caste system. Yeah. Um, and so he kind of has the, the idea that, you know, he's he he's not going to win this, right? He's going to get fired. Um, did you all have another passage like around this chapter area? No. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on page 13. Oh, okay. Well, my next one is. I don't know if you have one before that. No, not me. Okay. Well, I just wanted to touch on the first paragraph of chapter two, just because it kind of gives you a better idea of like the setting and where the story is taking place and how things have kind of started to become more segregated. Yeah, the, you know, unlike Tico, which is the like a housing, public housing development, you know, that, that is extremely, um, you know, oppressed because it's all this black segregated neighborhood here, you know, everyone else is white, you know, and, um, it's kind of, kind of interesting how you, like you said, historically, you know, he kind of mentions, well, a little bit history of like how this whole city started, you know, and, um, for city is here is kept like as a generic area, but, it's kind of uh, it kind of shows a lot of like how people are are uprooted from their neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. because of like um, um, redlining or you know discrimination in in terms of housing, you know, not not selling to certain people uh, of color and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he even mentions the uh, yeah you mentioned the history. He talks about the Maso mm -hmm. Pelea Indians uh, from the area, uh, mm -hmm. once inhabited the area, but were pushed out by the immigrants coming from Europe. And then, and you mentioned right the, and again, this is it's interesting. The narrator kind of knows his history <laughs> in this mm -hmm. sense, and then even then, still kind of has his opinions on the way he does. Um, but yeah. yeah we we pretty much established that in this neighborhood he, he says right except for me and my half and the way he says it, half of my son there were no other blacks in our neighborhood mm -hmm. yeah and um i you know uh in this in his neighborhood i had uh, a couple pages after that 15 um where he taught and we talked about this you talked about this Richie in part one a little bit about surveillance and uh, the surveillance state of this area 
um, the way that he conceives of it uh, is is in a way that he thinks this is for the good of like the black community, right? When, you know, of course, anyone who reads this now, we see this, this satirical element come in. Um, so I'll just read it. They're safety patrols, not surveillance fans, I said. Uh, and yes, it had cameras and infrared devices, um, but the vans checked in on any neighborhood where black folks live to monitor vital signs. Lower heart rates suggested barbiturates, elevated heart rates meant conflict. Uh, it was for our, that is black folks, own good. And when I was growing up, it wasn't uncommon for people to attack us in the streets. And I just thought it was very interesting how it's a euphemistic uh, way of him referring to sur the surveillance militarized states that he's in uh, in this in this city, and um, how you know these things that they're doing to the black community are really just another way of like you know keeping them put him in a, you know under the jail, right? And um, uh, of course he sees it as, as a good thing, um, but um, yeah, just one of those that really struck me in terms of how, how in the living conditions that he's in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, definitely. I, I point. I had this passage underlined as well, um, and it definitely reminded me, reminded me of that Orwellian uh, presence of you know monitor and and this message of of it being for your own good, uh, which is often kind of used in to apologize not to explain ex increased uh presence um police presence and uh you know it's it's not unlike you know laws that we see today you know that uh, like like stop and frisk laws that uh -huh. have come to be proven to to allow kind of prejudice in terms of how how people are stopped in the streets, you know, I think it's been shown uh, disproportionate in terms of people of color being the ones stopped uh, by police in these cases. And uh, of course, we I think we also mentioned that last line in the paragraph about um, uncommon for people to attack us in the streets, and and I can't help but think of the many the many names of of people killed by people who thought they were doing good or protecting the neighborhood when, you know, they were being extra vigilant or extra judicial, you know, going all the way back to, to you know, Trayvon Martin or even, even just recently Ahmad Arbery, you, you have these realities, right? Yeah. I mean, that we're living, you know, that they're, they're modern day lynchings, uh, that, you know, um, uh, shows that, you know, we haven't come far from, you know, the days of, of, you know, uh, of, 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 you know, slavery and, and uh, segregation. Mm -hmm. um, and here, you know, kind of the sci-fi angle is that kind of like Minority Report, if you all have seen it, yeah. where, you know, they're, they're also homodited in this way. Um, except that, you know, they have like, a, you know, really thought crime, but they call it, they call it pre-crime, um, is that, you know, the technology is only used uh, for, against Blacks, you know, as opposed to being used against everyone. And uh, of course, this is something that the narrator just accepts because he thinks it's for their own good. Um, so again, you know, it goes back to the idea of like how he's, um, he sees blacks as the ones that are more that are more predisposed to committing crime, just in part because you know he's seen it from Sir and uh, others as well that he he knows. I also had the one right after on eighteen, just because of how um, you know I saw the connection here to um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, birthmark, short story. Um, at the bottom of 18, where he says, um, the birthmark flashed at me. It had metamorphosed over the years. First, it had grown. By preschool, what had been a dot had spread to the bridge of his eyebrow. 
and eventually down the side of his face and he kind of keeps going and he compares it to um, the, the silhouette of the shape to the Wu-Tang Clan symbol turned on its head. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting because of how um, it's the same thing that happens in the birthmark where he sees it first. It's like this, this just, you know, insignificant little speck on his wife and who becomes a patient. Um, but all of a sudden he just becomes to notice it more. He becomes more obsessed with it up to the point where he can't stand it. And um, of course, this is the whole premise of, of him, you know, his motivation, right, is to remove it. And from the beginning, we're told, you know, that to him, that's on a normal face. And it reminded me also of um, critical disability studies, because in that theory, that literary theory, we, we look at, well, what is normal? You know, and many times you find that what is what is what is normal is really not normal uh, because it's just been perceived that way by the community or the you know the people in the story. Uh, and sometimes, you know, what is considered not normal is really what is truly normal. Um, so, you know, this is the case here, and um, you know, this is really what to the reader will be jarring, you know, because. Uh, you realize, you know, this this kind of um, um, uh, what's his name, uh, the, the 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 captain from uh, from uh, Moby Dick, Ahab. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, just like Ahab, right? That obsession with uh, with the whale. He's obsessed here with with the birthmark over his own wife's wishes mm-hmm. and Nigel's own wishes mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, in this section, he he really harpens on uh, his son having to cover it up with uh, uh, like a comically large cap. Yeah, hat. and then later on, yeah. we we'll find out about uh, the bleach, but we'll we'll put that on the on the back burner for now. Yeah, yeah, that that w- that was my next one on thirty seven. But I did you all have another one before that one? Yeah, um, on twenty eight. We get back into the law firm office life, mm. and I think it's it's just kind of interesting this interaction he has with with uh, one of the workers, Etherine, and it seems like she she cleans up and serves the staff there, and uh, the narrator is perplexed. Um, he can't understand why she dresses the way she dresses, and he he compares her to Mammy and Gone with the Wind, mm-hmm. and. Uh-huh. Uh, he he kind of flashes back to a time before anything we've read so far in the novel of uh, a conversation they had, and he confronts her about about how she dresses. Um, let me see. Yeah, it's the middle of the page. Uh, yeah, she realizes that uh, he's shaking her head. And he says, I was startled because I hadn't realized I was doing it. It was nothing. You don't think I know how you look down on me just like them people? I'm just trying to go home. I know you, she said. You think you're so fancy with your degrees and everything. I just don't know how you can dress like we're in the antebellum South. You think we ain't, she said. I got two daughters in college and a house that'll be mine after I pay out the mortgage. That's how I do it. She shook her head. You're wearing that suit, that fine suit now, but give it some time. They'll have you in a butler getup before too long. That's when you'll see. And that kind of even that goes back to the, the first scenes of the book, right? Where he's confused for the waitstaff. And, mm-hmm. you know, even mm-hmm. though it's not a, not a butler outfit, they're kind of having him dress up to, to get this position this, in this contest. And, and, and it's very perceptive of her and, all the more so, you know, because, he, you know, he's judging her, right? But it's really her who presents a more accurate judgment mm-hmm. of of what things are really like. You know, it's it really is kind of like going back to the answer about himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his actions and, and something that's not talked about, we haven't talked about or mentioned yet is uh, his interracial marriage. Mm. That um, there's a point made that, it just doesn't happen as it's not as common now in this society in the book we're reading. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. unfortunately, and unfortunately for the narrator, he under, he says he understands why by looking at his son, which is a kind of a sad mm-hmm. indication of the you know his, his the narrator's concern for his son's birthmark. Yeah, and, and it goes back to um, you know again how uh, Efren was referencing that you know we've gone back to the past, right? The horrible past and. You know, just like kind of you implied there that what they called miscegenation, right, was the outlier in the South, you know, for so long and was, uh, you know, uh, an excuse, a pretext for lynching, you know, those in the Black community. Um, and, um, you know, so just, just another example of how, again, in this kind of dystopian world, f- futuristic world, you know, they really have gone back and, um it's it's um it's you know again you know that satirical element comes in again mm-hmm. did you all have uh, something before 37 um well i just had on pages 34 and 35 kind of leading up to yours um mm-hmm. so nigel runs into a closet and he locks himself in there and doesn't let anyone, like, try to help him, because, uh-huh. I, he, well, he's kind of being bullied by some of the other students, uh-huh. um, not necessarily because of his birthmark, but because of the way he's been taught by his father to handle the birthmark, which is with um, a bleach cream that's uh-huh. supposed to lighten his skin. Um and I think it's interesting to see the way that his dad and Penny deal with it separately. So his dad is basically ready to like bust down the door and like get him. Mm-hmm. Whereas his mom, Penny, stands by the door and she's talking to him, trying to calm him down. And so I think it's really interesting to kind of see those two relationships as mm. like how they contrast from one another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good foreshadowing of, um, you know, the arguments that they have and uh, ultimately how, you know, she finds out about what he's trying to do uh, to Nigel. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, uh, a little after that uh, on 37, um, you know, he, she, so Penny, uh, the wife, um we've talked about it already you know that she's a white ally and because of that you know she clashes with our narrator um but um at the bottom of 37 when she finds out that you know um he had the madam cj lightning formula um that his dad gave him he's he, she says you gave our son skin, skin bleach Tell me you didn't give our son this shit. Penny, like most people, had different levels of anger. Cursing in front of her son meant that she was near the max level. The only higher level was where she separated my head from my body before driving a stake through my heart with her bare hands. What's wrong with you? Um, And, you know, of course, you get his perspective that, you know, he doesn't see it as a big deal. And they have, you know, uh, more arguments after that. But, um, to me, it just um, shows how, you know, first he's doing something behind her back, and second, you know, that it's it's Penny who, you know, sees that this is not something he should be doing, right? He should accept his son the way he is, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's it's a, obviously like a big source of conflict uh, between them two, and also, of course, uh, between him and and, and his own son. Yeah, um, that conflict, so a little bit after this, on page 40, um, you know, they kind of talk talk it out a little bit more. Uh-huh. They're, they're all in the car together on a road trip, and, you know, it's a little bit more telling of their different points of view. Uh-huh. Um, she kind of explains, let's see, yeah, 
where it says my cheeks flushed, I was more embarrassed. You know, Penny scolding him uh, for the whole bleach incident. He says, I realized that I'd been caught then that I'd given Nigel the cream behind her back, but a part of me wanted to make the promise to give into the possibility that maybe Penny was right. She always thought I was overcompensating in my attempts to protect Nigel. She seemed to think I saw monsters everywhere I looked, which was correct, of course. Um, I think that's an interesting perspective. You know, he wants to kind of go along with Penny, but I guess also from his own perspective and upbringing, he has seen, you know, monsters mm -hmm. as he, as he describes here. Um, and, and ultimately I just, I really like what, what Penny does here, a couple, uh, um, you know, throughout the next couple of pages first, um, you know, she look a little bit later on, she says, Penny, uh, Penny grabbed my face. I tried to look away, but she wouldn't let me. Are you really all good? I need you to be better for your son. I need you to love this family and love yourself. She, you know, she's really trying to, to push for him to understand that, that this is normal, right? What the narrator considers normal isn't exactly, you know, it's kind of hurtful to, to who they are. And, and I think her philosophies really capture it on page 41. This is probably like one of my favorite paragraphs early on in the book uh, where it says, I extended my hands. Um, and yeah, I just think it's a beautiful visual and, and kind of metaphor. Uh, all right, I'll just go ahead and read it. Penny took out a blue permanent marker and drew a misshapen circle. She often did this when we first met. She had a philosophy about focusing on the basics, the people in our orbit who mattered, the actions that supported instead of harmed. She chose a circle as a symbol of inclusion, but also because it was impossible to hand draw one perfectly. Perfection was the enemy. So I just think that's a, I think it's a pretty healthy approach of, of, of looking at things. You know, this idea that a lot of times people try and aim for perfection, but it's kind of a, ends up being a killer for most people's um, images of themselves and others. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate this explanation of her character and her philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good way of putting it, Richie. Um, you know, because it is that platonic ideal that we know, you know, only exists in our head, right? When we, the way that we see other people, you know, we want like something to be perfect or someone to be perfect. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I, to me, it's kind of like, um, you know, not just misguided, but uh, um, there's a way of, can, you know, reconciling that with, you know, just thinking about how even in imperfection, there's a certain perfection. If you think about how, you know, that true perfection you know, it, it is impossible in, in this kind of world where, you know, it's a fallible world and that you can imagine perfection in an imperfection, you know, because it's unique. Mm -hmm. it, no one else, no one else looks like you. No one else talks like you, you know, no one else has your, your exact DNA. And um, so I think the circle to me kind of also, I see it as like a yin yang you know, because it's also black and white and uh, it, it balances, you know, it balances the fact that he's biracial. He's, he's, you know, embodying both of their blood in mm -hmm. him. Right, right. I really like the, it's the circle. I don't know. I, I will, I really like that it's like misshapen also because it, it really does show that like not everything's going to be perfect but you just have mm -hmm. to like put in work in for stuff yeah yeah there's a lot of symbolism um heavy ones at that throughout the book yeah 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 i know you had some misrefers that you wanted to highlight um i had you know another passage to 55 so i don't know if you have one and if you had one before it but it's when they're at the old house and they're given a tour. Oof, yeah, that's such an interesting scene. Um, well, just before that, um, I have one on 41 as well. 
since since we're you know we're still there um and this kind of foreshadows the character of, of you know mama right with his with his mom mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. and i think it's really interesting there's some interesting things here um where he reflects on leaving nigel with her and uh the narrator's fears of of uh him being left out in the sun too long and darkening him and mm-hmm. uh the language used here you know is is not without purpose i think uh she use, uses the words drying up and darkening like a raisin, which uh, to me re- recalls Langston Hughes' poem, Harlem, mm-hmm. which I mentioned uh, in the previous episode. I think uh, Ralph Ellison is responding to an invisible man, right? What, what happens to a dream deferred? And, you know, one of the lines is there, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and of course, invisible man being the answer to, to the question, does it explode? Which is the last line of that poem. So uh, I think I feel like that line in, in there is pretty, pretty. It's nail on the head there, hearkening back to these lines, and uh, I think it, again it's super telling about who his mom is when mm-hmm. when he mentions not to mention all the propaganda she would cram into his head: black mm-hmm. empowerment, racial righteousness, resistance. The woman fed filthy protesters for free. Uh, it made me fall in love with her character right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and kind of, you know, you had already mentioned this, but the Aurelian factor, right? That he's very much bought into this idea that, you know, these ideas are just propaganda. Which I think is a good segue into the, our next scene, right? In the plantation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I think both of us had, you know, the same area, 53, 54, um, you know, where... You talked about this in part one about the historical revisionism. Um, And, uh, you know, to listeners, I think this will ring true in terms of, you know, textbooks in Texas uh, that eventually get distributed across the country where, you know, the North-South Civil War, uh, Confederates versus the U.S. Army, are framed differently just because of, you know, the editors decided to just whitewash things. Um, So, you know, this is uh, Mary here, you know, giving the tour and she's very much bought, you know, reflects this kind of world that they live in, you know, for the narrator's world that does exactly that, right? It kind of just whitewashes the civil war. and I think you had the, the the one here, Richie, right? About in fifty three. Yeah, on fifty three. So you you have your your uh, very campy tour guides. Uh, you know, it's a lot has made mention of their costumes, which they very much are. You know, very southern, and they, they're talking in these very thick southern accents. And uh-huh. and so on fifty three, you have uh, <clears throat> Mary, you know, sharing history, if you will, quote unquote history. You'll recall, Mary said, that the northern section of this present nation launched its war of unprovoked aggression on the presupposition that it was sovereign, it was sovereign supreme. To wit, the North believed it had the right to impose absolute authority over the economic structure and governing freedoms of these southern states. This was in no way different than the tyranny the founders fought and defeated in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and meanwhile, you have uh, Penny ready to... To jump on them, but I uh, I think your your quote also is an extension of this thought, right? Yeah, um, you know, they get into it, right? Penny and, and her, um, and you know, it's kind of an example of her using her white privilege, right? You know, where it's leveraged in a way that, you know, and again, if you see Get Out, it represents an interesting twist on that. But um, anyway, um, yeah, she says. Um, you know, Mary here says, every schoolboy school boy knows the Civil War didn't start because of slavery. This was just been Lincoln's cronies put out to keep the Europeans from joining the Confederacy. Read a book. Um, hey, literally, literally, <laughs> read a book. Right? <laughs> well, one of the few times where you actually don't want to take the advice of reading a book. Um, and, of course, Penny, like you said, you know, uh, she's very adamant, right, that, like, these are all lies, you know, that slavery was the cause, as we all know, of course, of the Civil War. Um, and, um, 
so yeah, I mean, I thought it was a, a good example of, of Penny's uh, personality um, as kind of um, standing, you know, in stark opposition to um, our narrator's own, you know, um, deference to the authorities yeah. and to um, the, the way that history here has been subverted. Yeah, again, that Orwellian mm-hmm. presentation of truth. What is truth? Mm-hmm. Uh, to to kind of go back a little on on, on Penny's character, um, I mentioned I mentioned this in our pre-show discussion, but on fifty one it it talks about uh, Penny and and the way she reacts to incidents of, of what he says obvious racism and bigotry, um, and uh, something that I commend Ruffin for is all throughout the book there's these great uh, there's this great imagery, uh, mm-hmm. very entertaining at times that that really makes these comparisons and brings them alive. And so in the middle of the page 51, um, yeah, he had this line, uh, Penny rarely turned away from incidents of obvious racism or bigotry. She jumped into them like a Viking with a long sword, her neck flushed as she dismantled her opponent's arguments. And this is kind of setting up the way in which uh, she steps up to, to take down this, this uh, tour guide, Mary. And of course she's an actor, her name, her name is not really Mary, essentially being confronted at, at the truth. I think this is really telling and interesting uh, in contemporary times mm-hmm. after being confronted with, with, the, with uh, her side of the story, the mm-hmm. Mary rage quits <laughs> and, uh, and uh, stops acting, right? All of a sudden she has a, a New Jersey accent and we find the, her, name, her name is Merle. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, it refl- I've seen this happen a couple of times in this administration, when uh, mm. people are just trying to to question what's happening and and, and looking for truth, I, you see people, you know, to name a few, Mister Mister Forty Four, Forty Five, there storm mm-hmm. off and, and rage quit himself. So I thought yeah. it was a, a pretty interesting um, scene in that sense. Yeah, that, that's a very good way of uh, putting putting it. You know, connecting it to the modern day. Um, and what you said about Penny, you know, um, I think it's, it's nonetheless worth underlining that she has that white privilege, you know, of like being able to be angry, being able to be combative. To enter that, that space, yeah. Mm-hmm, that, you know, our narrator doesn't have, you know, whether it's, you know, as we find out in other passages, mm-hmm. like, you know, there's another scene where he gets frisked they think that he's some kind of, of robber or, you know, whatever burglar. Um, and, uh, the cop, you know, the black cop just tells him, well, you know, it's for your own safety, you know, which of course doesn't make sense. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, I think it, it is interesting in terms of how Penny is able to make good use of that white privilege of her, of hers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also like, that um, what actually starts it is Nigel speaks up Mm -hmm. and that's what kind of so he's watching his mom do like be this big powerful woman that's not afraid to say what's on her mind and so he Mm -hmm. sees that and he's now becoming somewhat the person that's going to speak up for these things as well Mm. yeah it's definitely good foreshadowing there that's a really good um good scene there Vanessa and you know because she doesn't really say anything right I mean she's just kind of you know that her body language speaks louder and uh, Nigel picks up on that and I think it kind of shows that the way the ways that, that the two opposing forces act on Nigel whether it's you know his father or uh, his mother mm-hmm. after this this whole debacle um, what did you all have in the subsequent chapters in part one? I didn't have any more parts from part one. Okay. Um, I mean, just in a, in a general sense, I just think it's interesting to, to learn more about the, the law firm's inner workings. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we do learn that our narrator is, is promoted. Uh-huh. And the way it's talked about is, is kind of like, the, the language you hear when when people talk about affirmative action that mm-hmm. you know, it's it's because they needed uh, 
the the representative, the token black man in the in the position mm. because their diversity board was all white filled with all white people. Yeah. And um I think it's also interesting that you mentioned how we don't really see too many court cases and stuff, but we do learn that and I mentioned I've already mentioned this, but we learned that, you know, he's the narrator is actually seems to be pretty proficient in law. Uh-huh. Do pretty well. Despite all this, right? It's this idea of again when people talk about affirmative action, like are they qualified? And we learn that he he really is, but they talk about him more in the other sense that the diversity higher. And um, mm-hmm. and ultimately, you know, thinking of power structures, we learn that you know the law firm has its hands in in some sort of power dynamic in in the entire region, where uh-huh. they're they're even trying to influence local politics, right? Where they. They, uh, you know, they have plans to introduce some, the mayor, you know, a mayor, mayoral candidate. Yeah, and yeah. that whole bit, you know, reminded me of the Brotherhood and in, um, Invisible Man. Yeah. You know, that they, they are political and they're just using him, the Invisible Man, uh, for the same reason that Octavia um, is using uh, our protagonist in this one. Mm-hmm. It's just because, you know, he's black, he can go into the community, you know, and just like in Black Klansmen, right, to some degree. Um, mm-hmm. So um, you, you mentioned uh, his promotion, R- R- Richie, and, you know, being a kind of, uh, he's the, the token diversity hire, right, or p- promote promotion. Um, on 64, I just found it interesting, though, that even though he was technically promoted, he he wasn't actually he didn't actually become shareholder that's right yeah you know and so it's still mm. one of the one of the ways that people of color are kept from actual positions of power right is just by saying well yes you're on this but there's this caveat you know i think it's very common he's uh, for prov- something like that to happen yeah he's provisional as as it's stated mm-hmm. yeah um, so it's, it's very, uh, precarious, you know, uh, the position that he's in. Um, and, um, but it's still something that he f- figures he can leverage to actually do this for his son. Right. And this whole thing, you know, he's willing to do it all just so that his son can undergo that demilitarization pro- procedure experiment that, uh is his dream Hmm. um so that's part one i think right um you know they mentioned um (laughs) they want to target specifically the personal hill hospital phh Uh, is one of their targets um and um so there's more things that happen because of that, that, you know, they go into in part two. Um, but, um, uh, well, um, you know, to the listeners, uh, I hope that um, if you haven't had a chance to um, uh, read the paperback or the hardcover of this book, uh, and I'm not sure if there's an audiobook version of it, but um, it's something that we'll look into. Um, but we're really excited about moving on to uh, part two and uh, hope that, you know, y'all can, um, can check this book out because of how relevant it is and um, how kind of prescient it is in some ways, right. In terms of how it's able to depict a future that might seem um, preposterous, but is really not that far fetched considering our current uh, regime. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode discussing We Cast a Shadow by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. And if you haven't read it, we hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. Literally Literary is brought to you by the Mellon Foundation through the Humanities Collaborative at EPCC and UTEP. Follow us on Instagram at literallyliterary.ep and on Twitter at literallylitep.